Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to an iTest webinar on the particular topic of COVID-19 and man's continued desire for God. This is a pretty timely topic right now, and we hope that we will present to you this afternoon some things that are well worth thinking about. I'm going to begin by asking Sister Marisha Weber to offer an opening prayer for this. Thank you, Tom. Lord God, you freely created us to share in your blessed life. You have placed a desire for you in each of our hearts. You never cease to draw us close to you. We pray for an end to this pandemic. Pour out your loving care upon the sick, upon those who care for them, and all those affected by the coronavirus. Grant eternal rest to all who have died. Lord, as we gather together for this webinar, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. May we draw closer to you during this Lenten season. You who make all things new, bring forth new life through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, uh, okay, for those of you who are newcomers to this, I want to let you know what ITEST is. ITEST stands for Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology. And we've been here for 50 years doing conferences, seminars, lecture series, Certainly our bulletin, which comes out quarterly, it's all part of the iTest activity. And the members of iTest are drawn from all manner of different professions, scientists and theologians, but also other people, accountants, doctors, uh, lawyers, people out there in the world. They're brought together by the common um, belief or the common commitment to recognize that science is not the enemy of faith, Science and faith are compatible. They are shared ways, compatible ways, that we reach forward and learn more about our world, about God, and about our lives and ourselves. So over the years, iTest has held many different uh, topics, including things having to do with uh, biophysics, um, things having to do with education. We, um, some years ago, we had one on food, uh, genetically modified foods, things like that. The topics over the years have ranged over a very wide range of science, but in every case it comes together with that theme that we are going to show how science and faith are compatible and work together. So today's conference is very similar in that respect, in that we are in the middle of a terrible national and international crisis, but we are here bringing ourselves together with the thought that science and faith are going to come together and each have something to say of importance on this topic. So I don't want to belabor the background of iTest for too long because I know most of our attendees today are already iTest members and are well connected with what we already do. So I want to begin right away by introducing our first speaker, who is Father Nicanor Ostriaco. Now, he comes to us today from the Philippine Islands. It's about three in the morning there. He's a professor at Providence College in Rhode Island, but he isn't there right now because of um, the shutdown and the lockdown that everybody's experiencing. But his uh, role there is professor of biology and of theology. But he's also the principal investigator of the Ostraco Laboratory at Providence College. And that is a very important role too. He's also a research fellow at the Center for Religious Studies and Ethics at the University of Santo Tomas in the Philippines. So that's why he's going back and forth, except he's stabilized in one place right now. Well, the focus of his presentation will be on demonstrating how science is the one way to respond, or is one of the ways to respond to this pandemic, because that is what God has given to us. Father Nicanor. Thank you very much, Tom. And like, like Tom said, uh, hello from the Philippines, where it is now four o'clock in the morning on Wednesday morning. 
And I'm glad to be part of this international Zoom seminar. Um, in the 15 minutes that have been allocated to me, I'd like to, to address two particular questions. The very first question is a question that my, one of my students asked, a few, asked me a few days ago. What, is the pen, what does this COVID-19 pandemic mean? And so I'd like to talk about the meaning of this pandemic. And then I'd like to propose that science is one of the responses to, this, to a theological understanding of what this pandemic is all about. So let me just begin. For my friends who are non-believers, and I have many friends as molecular biologists, I spend a lot of time at conferences where I'm surrounded by men and women who don't believe. The question about the meaning of the pandemic is very un is unintelligible. Many of them will simply say, look, it's about numbers. It's about the probability that a virus will jump from one species to another. And once this event happens, it's all about numbers with regards to viral spread. And the virus, virus will simply spread until it's, it's stopped pretty much by herd immunity. And in that process, people will die. That's just the very nature of how viruses are in, a, in an evolving world. But for, but for believers, the question of what this pandemic means is incredibly salient. So a few years ago, I served as a hospital chaplain at New York Cornell Presbyterian Hospital on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And one of the questions I would get from many of my patients, whether or not they were struggling with cancer, a heart attack, some chronic illness, a stroke, would be, what does this mean? And what they, what they usually mean by that is that, why did, the, why did God allow this to happen to me? And so it's a very important and salient question because believers, especially Christian believers, are convicted by the proposition, the claim, that there is a providential God that is taking care of all of us. And so it's really important, I think, that we address that question. I'm going to make a distinction between the suffering that's endured by an individual and the suffering that's endured by a community. Because when I speak to these individuals, so many of them blame themselves. They see the illness, the heart attack, the cancer, the tumor, the stroke as divine punishment. And one of the things that Jesus was very clear about, and I'm referring here to the ninth chapter of John's Gospel, uh, in, the, in the ninth chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus speaks about a blind man. And he meets a blind man, and the people around him will ask whether or not the blind man is blind because of his sin or the sin of his parents. And this is what Christ says. I actually had this ready. He says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And so that's a very profound statement of the Savior, that we don't really know why this individual got sick. And I tell that to a lot of people when I speak to them about suffering. I'm not sure. I don't know. All I know is that there's a God there who loves you, and that in some deeply mysterious way, as Christ says, God will display his works in and through your life. And I pray with my patients, and I hope that one day they will be able to see through all of that suffering how the works of God were displayed in their lives. But when we get to communities, though, it's very different because Christ does not say this about the sufferings of an entire community. And there are numerous narratives in the Old Testament, as well in the New Testament, especially in the book of Revelation, where large communities, large populations of people suffer. And so we can ask 
why do these large communities suffer from pestilence, from plague? Now, there are three possibilities. One, it's a blessing. Two, it is punishment in some way. And three, it is a test. And we can't really tell which one of these three is operational at a particular point in time. We, it's, so if we look at this COVID-19 pandemic, I think very few people right now are going to say that it is a blessing. It's just very hard to see the blessing in the increasing number of deaths, in the exponential rise of cases of sick, some very seriously sick people throughout the planet. Not only the people who are sick, but the people who are in quarantine. So I'm in quarantine here in the Philippines and it's nothing like any of the quarantines in the United States. So I'm currently in quarantine in the island of Zuzon with 54 million other Filipinos. The quarantine is very strict. You are not allowed to leave your house, leave your gate, even to go for a walk, to pray my rosary, for example, or to go for a run. You have to stay in your house. You are allowed to leave your home if you have a quarantine pass. You can only leave your home to do one thing, and that is to go to the groceries in order to buy food. And if you are 60 or older, that too is prohibited. You cannot leave your home. And at 7.58 every night, there is a siren that goes off throughout the entire capital area of Manila, basically reminding people that we are in a state of quarantine. And this quarantine, this lockdown is incredibly important because the impoverished healthcare system here in the Philippines would not be able to, to survive a COVID surge. It would, it would overrun our supplies. It would basically crush and destroy the healthcare system. But not surprisingly, a lot of people are suffering because of this lockdown. People who are especially the poor, especially the marginalized, those who live on a daily wage, on a daily job, they themselves right now, their lives are threatened because of the lockdown. And so you have millions of people who are suffering. And so I, I would doubt that many of them would call this a blessing. Not now anyway. But so we have the two options. We have punishment and we have test. And there are a lot of people, especially back home in the United States, who do not want to see this as punishment. And I think it's very important to see that we, if we talk about the category of punishment, we're talking about the punishment of a father. It's loving punishment. It is loving correction. It is about setting things aright that were not going the way that they should have gone. Now, it's really important to see that if you look at the Old Testament, it's not clear who is being punished. Because you have stories where King David, because of his particular sin with Bathsheba, his people were plagued for his particular sin. So all we, all the tradition, the Catholic tradition is very clear. Um, one particular category that we can look at with regards to these type of global pandemics is a call to penance, a call to prayer. And I think that's one of the things that we have to do, especially in this time of Lent. We have to respond to, to, the, to, the, to the pandemic, one through prayer, one through, and then second through penance. But the third category is also important. This is also a test. And it's a test. If you look at the history of the church, if you look at the history of God's chosen people, it's about a test to fidelity. It's about being called to fidelity. And here in this case, it's a call to fidelity to service. And so we are called to serve. I was talking to one of my students who is doing a post-baccalaureate research year at the National Institutes of Health. And because the NIH labs were closed and shut down because of the COVID pandemic, he wanted to talk to me about how he could volunteer to take groceries around to help those who are homebound. And this is the kind of thing we are being asked to do. So we have to respond with penance. We have to respond with prayer. 
but we've also got to respond with service. And I'd like to propose that science is one way in which many of us are called to serve at this time. So I'd like to conclude with a few minutes just to talk about the kind of efforts that are ongoing in order to pursue, to identify therapeutics as well as a vaccine. And just to give you a, a, a scientifically accurate sense of what's going on. So with regards to therapeutics, basically the entire scientific community is throwing everything, including the kitchen sink at COVID. So if you look at the clinical trials, we are clinically, we are trying all sorts of all purpose medications, including metformin, for example. So if any of you out there um, are struggling with keeping your glucose levels under control, be, uh, because you are pre-diabetic, then one of the things that, you, that, you, that, are, that is usually prescribed is metformin. It's an anti-diabetic pill that is able to retool in a way we do not understand our metabolism. Metformin is being tested on COVID-19. And so there are numerous antivirals. There are anti-malaria drugs. There are anti-diabetic drugs. We're hitting everything we can because the hope is that we'll be able to identify an already approved FDA approved drug that will allow us to treat COVID-19. Now, I know back home in the United States, there's been a lot of controversy over the anti-malaria pills, chloroquine and hydrochloroquine. Um, what is so striking being here in the Philippines is that it's a very different perspective to be removed from the hyper-polarized political theater that we that we live in back home in the united states people don't realize for example in asia that hydrochloroquine and chloroquine are actually commonly used oh, well they're frontline drugs here in asia because they're incredibly inexpensive and they're incredibly accessible because malaria is endemic to many parts of asia and there are again um, the hope and the prayer is that these drugs, like any of the other drugs that are being tested, uh, one of them at least will be able to respond to and, and mitigate the pandemic. The second thing is the vaccines. Now, um, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, is actually the third novel coronavirus in two, in two decades. So you had SARS-1, and then you had MERS, and now we have SARS-2. And what is striking about those is that the efforts to find a vaccine against coronavirus, including the current coronavirus, has shown us that coronavirus 1 uh, is a little bit more sophisticated than the flu. Uh, we're not quite sure why, but it turns out that vaccines against coronavirus, the previous coronaviruses, including uh, vaccines against coronaviruses found in other mammals, can, sub, can sometimes trigger a much more virulent form of the disease. It's called enhanced disease. So one of the things that people are working on um, is to try to find a vaccine that is actually not more difficult, more, uh, more deadly than the disease itself. Which is why when a lot of people are saying to me that, you know, we'll get a vaccine in a couple of months, it's very clear that a vaccine against coronavirus is gonna take 12 to 18 months from now, which is why it's really important that we focus our efforts on finding a therapeutic response to COVID-19 in addition to vaccinating against COVID-19, because so both of these are, 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 are kind of two arms of the same strategy to, to suppress the pandemic and to eventually, to eventually stop it. So I think that in closing, I think it's really important to see that uh, there's so much science going on right now. There's also a lot of misinformation going on around right now, but we have to pray, and this is where for those of us who are not scientists, who are frontline in COVID, we have to pray, we have to do penance, we have to fast, especially in this time of Lent, um, for God's grace and for God's mercy and for God's inspiration for those who are trying to come up with novel therapies to prevent the further spread of the, of the pandemic. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Father Nicanor. I appreciate your, uh, your um, uh, let's see, I am now unmuted by Oaks. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much for your perspective on this. Uh, all right. In our previous things that we sent out to people in advance of this uh, webinar, there were several different things at uh, various URLs and so forth given. Uh, a certain Father Luke Deisinger made a very nice video about what to do in this terribly unusual time when you can't even go to mass. You know, our curtailment of our religious exercises is quite serious. So one of the URLs that you'll find in the uh, uh, announcement of this webinar includes that um, video by uh, Father Deisinger. However, that's just a preliminary thing. Right now, we're going to move on to our second speaker of the day, and that's Father Tom Davis. Um, Father Davis is a priest of the Melkite Catholic Church, one of the Eastern Byzantine Rite Catholic Churches in full communion with the See of Rome. Uh, besides having a long career practicing law, he has been married to Joanne Fatsy uh, Davis for 31 years. He's the pastor of St. Anne Melkite Catholic Church in Danbury, Connecticut. Now, Father Tom is also the chair of the Bioethics Graduate Concentration Program at Holy Apostles College and Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut. His relationship with Holy Apostles reaches back over a quarter century, teaching courses related to bioethics, including bioethics and law, medical ethics, and case studies in bioethics. Father Tom is president and founder of the St. John Paul II Bioethics Center, which is a division of the Liberty Institute for Faith and Ethics. He also heads the Religious Liberty Observatory and the Center for the Study of Bioethics and Law. Father Tom has published many papers about the morning after pill, known as Plan B, and related topics. Father Davis holds several degrees, uh, notably his Juris Doctor degree is from Quinnipiac University School of Law. He also holds a Master of Arts in Moral Theology from Holy Apostles College and Seminary. In his legal career, Father Tom is an Assistant Attorney General of the State of Connecticut and part of the Alliance Defending Freedom, or ADF, which defends life, the natural family, and religious liberty. He is a member of the State Bar in Connecticut and in New York, and admitted to practice before the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. So he will have quite an interesting talk to present to you today. And with that, I turn it over to Father Tom Davis. Thank you, Tom. I much appreciate the opportunity to address this webinar. And I would like to begin, first of all, by echoing Father Nicanor's very uh, powerful presentation, his very important presentation uh, about the question many people have, why? Why a pandemic? I think he's nailed it. Um, and I encourage people to go back, watch the video again, watch his full comments. Uh, I'll, I'll pass over the por portion that I had uh, I jotted some notes down about on that because I think he really addressed it uh, beautifully. But let me also begin, before I get into the bioethical concerns, by encouraging people to deepen their trust in God at this time, really abandonment to God, remembering that he is in charge. Jesus taught very clearly that even a sparrow doesn't fall from the sky without our Father knowing and that we are worth a lot more than many sparrows. The point is to open ourselves to trust in God at this time. And also, of course, place ourselves under the protection of the Theotokos, the mother of God. Father Luke uh, Deisinger prepared a promotional uh, video that Tom mentioned. Uh, in it, he makes some very profound reflections about this time of Eucharistic absence, the closing of churches, the inability to attend mass. Uh, and he suggested that treating all of this as a time of fasting and understanding this as fasting, would be helpful, and I want to echo those comments as well. Um, I'm a, an Eastern Rite Catholic in the Byzantine churches. The season of Lent is a liturgical, so we are not permitted to celebrate Eucharistic divine liturgy except on Sunday. So in the Byzantine world, we're quite familiar with and 
it's really the norm to experience the Eucharistic fasting. Um, and really, uh, it's not really spiritual fasting. And we go even deeper into their spiritual life, and you think of the English martyrs or the many who were imprisoned in gulags during the Soviet era, uh, facing persecution in the communist regimes uh, behind the curtain and also in China and the Far East. It's still going on. Uh, people who endured extraordinary periods of Eucharistic fasting, uh, but had the experience of a devout and profound uh, communion with our Lord. So with that little bit, let me jump into some of the major bioethical issues that arise uh, in the face of the COVID-19 crisis. The first thing is to understand the foundational principle. Uh, the foundational principle is simple, enunciated beautifully by St. John Paul the Great and uh, throughout his entire papacy, even before. Each individual person is unique, each person is precious, each person is unrepeatable. That's always the starting point in any bioethical analysis. And it, of course, becomes a starting point in those specific topics that are proximate to addressing COVID-19. So first and foremost, the question is how do we save lives? How do we mitigate suffering that's encountered? How do we assure justice in the distribution of limited resources to deal with the illnesses? And those are the major issues right now being confronted by bioethicists, by ethicists, by political leaders, by medical professionals, by research scientists. Number one in all of this is that science is to be respected. It is to be given a priority after prayer, after repentance, after abandonment to God and trust in him. Science must be given the priority. And it's key. It's amazing rapidity with which the virus is being attacked. Uh, Father Nicanor addressed that, so I'll move past it, but they really are throwing, as he said, the kitchen sink at everything. Um, and that's really quite uplifting. There's been tremendous progress, at least anecdotally reported on some therapeutic approaches, uh, as he said, a vaccine is, is really down the road. Uh, Dr. Fauci, in those daily briefings that many of us are familiar with seeing uh, in the afternoons uh, from the White House, has commented reasonably that, that recently that we may, be, uh, we may be encountering a seasonal uh, virus so that uh, we can see it flatten and reduce, uh, go through our summer and, and then see it come back again as we enter into the fall. So it's unlikely a vaccine will be ready by that time. So tremendous amount of resource going into therapeutic approach, which is really critical to get us through the next wave that may come from this virus uh, come after summer. Uh, so science is key. And science isn't an a, a non, amorphous, anonymous thing. Science is people. Science is scientists, research assistants, doctors, people who have studied and developed the talents they have been given, the potentials they have to address these questions. They deserve a tremendous amount of our respect. I, I can't help but reflecting briefly on Jesus' parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, verse, I think it's 14 to 25. And the story is simple, right? Uh, uh, a man is off on a journey, he calls his servants, and he gives to each of those servants some measure of talent. Uh, two of those servants uh, trade on those talents and double them. One had five, he ends up with 10. One had uh, two, he ends up with four. A third servant is given a single talent and he buries it. And when the man returns and finds out what's happened, he praises those who have developed their talents. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I would give you great responsibilities. Come share in your master's joy. Well, certainly the nurses, the physicians, the research scientists, all those allied with them, and there are many different intellectual disciplines, are individuals who have not buried those talents. They have developed those talents. They've invested their energy and their resources and their potentials are now uh, being called to a really great responsibility. So what can we say about it? 
I can say that all of the financial and facility support necessary for them to develop those talents further in addressing COVID is an imperative. And it is a bioethical urgent, uh, bioethically urgent imperative. It means that uh, the availability of things like ventilators, medicines, personal protective equipment, masks, gowns, gloves, um, they have to be developed with an exponential speed. A gratifying examples of that are happening. We're seeing it, I just read uh, this morning, uh, that General Motors, for instance, um, other manufacturers are retooling and are producing 50,000 ventilators in the near future. Um, this is all ex incredibly expensive undertaking. Uh, we see incredible, uh, although there was a lot of political jockeying, we can, we can set all that aside. Uh, politicians get involved in political jockeying. It really is not a matter for us to get swept up in. Uh, that's okay. Uh, what they have done is they've come together and put tremendous financial resources uh, in service of this kind of development. Uh, that's very important. That's a great sign of solidarity within our society. Um, I'm one who sees us uh, in a lot better shape than those who see us as hopelessly divided. I think this is an example of it. Uh, even, uh, I love this one, the my pillow. Uh, I use a my pillow. It's a fantastic pillow. I get great sleep with my pillow. Uh, I did a Trumpist, I get great sleep with my pillow. Um, so so uh, uh, the owner of my pillow, Mike Lindell, has retooled much of his production facilities now, and they're producing masks and gowns, personal protective equipment. That's fantastic. We need a lot of that. Um, I have relatives uh, working in hospitals now uh, with COVID patients, uh, and they are in dire need of personal protective equipment. It's a very short supply. Uh, so that's a great thing. And the resources for this is part of uh, what's going on. Those are things that are demanded by the virtue of justice. Um, and uh, Father Nicanor would especially like reference to the virtues. He's a Dominican. and I think uh, Aquinas was very much um, a virtue theorist. Uh, healthcare workers themselves are stepping forward, and that's a profound example also. And it's also not just a question of justice. I mean, of, of, uh, it's also one of fortitude. These workers have uh, tremendous talents, and to some extent, they have an obligation to step forward. Um, but it still takes guts uh, to walk into an emergency room uh, today that are packed in some places um, and uh, take the risks that are involved, especially with the lack of protective equipment. Um, so the first response is that the frontline workers have to be given all the resources available to attack the problem. And that appears uh, to be what's happening. Um, I think of uh, also uh, those in the industries that assist that. We talked about a few of those, General Motors, and I think Ford is also involved in it. I'm sure there's many others that are jumping into the fray. We have to think also of the food supply, the truckers who are getting material to the markets. Uh, to the public safety officers, the police, firefighters, EMTs, correctional officers. Uh, all of these people are stepping up in circumstances that require uh, care and protection. So uh, all those resources being marshaled to produce ventilators, masks, gowns, gloves, and all that kind of stuff. Those are fundamental uh, needs uh, that flow out of those basic uh, fundamental principle that each person is unique, each is precious, each is unrepeatable, and uh, we have to do what we can to preserve those lives and to mitigate the suffering that is endured. Now, let me not forget in mentioning them, the armed forces. Uh, the National Guard built a hospital in the Javits Center in New York City. They're building more in other cities around the country. Uh, a naval ship, a hospital ship, entered into New York Harbor yesterday and docked this morning uh, in New York. Um, that kind of marshalling of tremendous resources by uh, the federal government, by the state governments, are essential responses, and they're bioethical responses um, to the COVID uh, crisis. The next big question that comes up, however, is very dicey and uh, raises many concerns, and that is who gets care? Rationing is happening. That's a sad reality. It's a necessary reality. There's not enough equipment to go around. Hopefully we'll overcome that with production. But right now, rationing happens. How do we decide who gets the care? 
Well, uh, there are principles of justice and respect for persons that have to be honored. So that things like uh, religion, race, sex, mental, physical disability must never be the sole criteria for receiving care in a crisis. Um, rather, what has to happen and is happening by medical societies across the country, Texas recently adopted, New York State's adopted, other states are rapidly adopting. I think before the next 48 hours, all 50 states will have clear guidelines in place. Uh, triage rules that govern individual care where there is a need to ration out what's available. Uh, so uh, what that requires is an individual assessment of the individual patient. The here and now assessment of the current condition, the acute presentation, the underlying morbidities. Uh, assessments of reasonable hope of benefit from the treatments involved. Uh, that may include, in some circumstances, also assessing as one of many factors, but never a sole factor, someone's age. It may include assessing someone's pre-existing conditions, almost has to include the assessing of one's pre-existing conditions in order to assess the reasonable hope of benefit of a particularized treatment. So the here and now presentation of individuals um, is essential uh, and one that excludes sole criteria uh, like religion, race, sex, mental, physical disability. Uh, the United States Department of Justice announced that one of its divisions will be monitoring these criteria to be sure that those kind of individual characteristics I just described are not the determining factor um, and we can be grateful for that as well. But I, frankly, these kind of decisions are not made by one person standing alone. These involve teams. Medical care and triage in these patients involve physicians and nurses and personal care assistants, infectious disease experts, pulmonary experts. Um, so all of these multiple voices are working together and making the assessments. So I have great confidence that uh, these criteria are being evenly and fairly applied. Uh, there was a statement yesterday from the bishops in the state of Texas applauding the criteria established by the Texas Medical Society. Uh, one of the bishops of Texas dissented from that statement, but in a very narrow, very narrow way on one small detail that I don't think to be uh, of major significance. The overall thrust of these developments is extremely encouraging and they are providing for just assessment of individual need uh, in particular cases. So uh, there are some other obligations that we have to think about in the bioethical approach to what happens with COVID. One of those things that is disturbing is the hoarding of supplies. Uh, hoarding supplies that are in short supply is a sin. I don't think I can say it any more clearly than that. Uh, is it hoarding to take two packages of toilet paper that's shrink-wrapped and 15 pieces each? No, of course not. We're talking about mass hoarding. Uh, that kind of thing, for, especially for things that are personal protective equipment or disinfectant materials or gloves that are needed, uh, that's really a horrible, uh, detestable conduct. Now, personal responsibility can be mitigated by people's fear. They're acting out of character, what they would normally do. That's all understandable but we need to keep level head and understand that when we make choices about what we do in the face of a pandemic, we are engaging our moral soul. And if we hold the water of our soul in our hands and spread open our fingers, it's gonna pour out. So it's critical that we not engage in uh, that kind of hoarding of necessary supplies that others need. There's also the reckless, very re reckless refusal of some people to observe public health authorities' guidelines or orders. I think of the students we saw partying on beaches in Florida as recently as four or five days ago. Um, they're young. There's some mitigation there. But following public health officials' instructions and warnings about the dangers of infecting ourselves and infecting others is essential. So social distancing rules must be observed, and a failure to observe them uh, can amount to a violation of the Fifth Amendment. I think of uh, particularly disturbing reports of pastors 
who have crowded churches with packed uh, audiences to carry out services uh, in this time, totally unacceptable response and certainly to be avoided in all cases. Uh, this morning, when that U.S. Naval Hospital ship docked in New York, you could see along the shore on television a lot of people gathering shoulder to shoulder, packing it in to see that ship. Um, there's excitement when a ship comes into harbor. Again, uh, we've been given the intelligence and we're obliged to use it. That kind of behavior must be avoided and the public health authority warnings have to be observed. We have a duty to take reasonable care of our health and to accept uh, instruction about the reasonable care necessary for others to avoid grave harm. So uh, washing hands, avoiding contamination of others, if we have symptoms, self-quarantining for the time periods required, those are very grave obligations to be observed uh, in a time of this crisis. And finally, I'd like to make a, a mention about uh, advanced medical directives. There has been a good deal of publication in articles and magazines that get wide distribution. I saw one the other day in an Atlantic magazine uh, recommending that people execute advanced medical directives. And this I want to offer a word of grave caution. Advanced medical directives, the standard ones, they are usually drawn directly from statutes and state law, uh, are extremely dangerous documents. Uh, they need to be carefully drawn and not uh, simply use the form off the shelf. The reason for that is the form off the shelf document is usually a living will. And it is a self-executing document that does not assess individualized circumstances in the immediate here and now as presented when someone is incapacitated and cannot communicate on their own behalf, but assumes that whenever that incapacity happens, certain things are to be refused if certain conditions are met. That might be appropriate. It might be very appropriate. It's much wiser to execute instead a proxy document where you appoint someone on your behalf to make decisions for you and your health if you are incapacitated. Someone who knows you, who knows your values, hopefully someone who loves you, and allow them uh, to have the properly delegated authority to make decisions on your behalf if you're incapacitated. What are the conditions that we want to see or the circumstances or the criteria we want to see uh, as the foundation for those decisions. Very simple formula, sometimes maddeningly difficult to apply, but the formula is where there is a reasonable hope of benefit without undue burden, then care should be provided, treatment should be provided. How do we look at that? Well, if there's no reasonable hope of benefit, then we say generally care is futile. And uh, in, in a time of scarcity, uh, demanding futile services is unjust and we must forego them. Uh, but if the care does offer a reasonable hope of benefit, if it is not futile care, and we assess that always by uh, advice and instruction from those professionals who can make a prognosis, so you must go to the medical personnel and, and speak to them. You can quiz them, ask them lots of questions. I have four sisters who are nurses, three uncles, doctors, two cousins, physicians. They don't mind questions from patients. They like questions from patients. They're happy to engage you and to give you here and now analysis, to talk to you about what are the underlying conditions, how do they relate to one another, what medications or equipment can be used to alleviate or treat, and what is the prognosis in light of all of that, once that information is known, a decision can be made about whether there is a reasonable hope of benefit. So every advanced directive, every proxy statement should say, if there is a reasonable hope of benefit, I want the care provided, so long as it does not provide, uh, involve an undue burden. Now, you're allowed to accept undue burden. You could say, where well, there's a reasonable hope of benefit, I don't care how much it's painful, or a burden to me, I want the care. That's certainly a choice many would make. Uh, others would not want to accept undue burden, and they're not obliged to. Uh, undue burdens are things that cause excessive, intense, unremitted pain, have a serious risk of death, uh, or that can financially bankrupt someone who has obligations to support others. Those are some examples of 
an undue burden that warrants foregoing, if one decides to forego, care that would otherwise offer a reasonable hope of benefit. And that kind of language can be placed into an advanced directive or into a proxy designation authorizing others to act on our behalf uh, when we're uh, incapacitated. So um, <clears throat> let me conclude with a couple of comments, very brief uh, on something that Father Nicanor, Nicanor uh, raised. Why the virus? He suggested three possibilities, and I agree with him that we simply cannot say in the individual case why someone is affected by it or is not. But what we can say, and we can know definitively, that everyone dies. That is the human condition. Death came to the world through sin. This is a very clear statement in Romans by St. Paul. What does it mean? It means that we are strangers and sojourners passing through a temporal life to something in another dimension that we cannot understand. And as much as we cannot understand what that dimension will be, similarly, we cannot understand exactly why the COVID crisis has come upon us. It is a time for a certain amount of solitude, hopefully with family, the people we love. Some people don't have that benefit. They're in nursing homes, for instance, isolated from their families, hopefully with caregivers who genuinely appreciate them and care for them. But for most of us, it is a time of a relative solitude, a time to go deeper in prayer, as Father Nicanor suggested, a time to go deeper in repentance, and to pray, especially for those who are on the front line. Those who are the medical providers, the research scientists, the political leaders who have to allocate resources and make decisions about perhaps enforced quarantines of the type we're hearing about from Father uh, in the Philippines. Uh, there are encouraging signs that the doubling rate has significantly slowed in New York City, for instance. There are encouraging signs that a leveling off appears to be happening or to have happened now in Italy. Uh, and may happen soon in uh, New York and in other places across the country. But primarily and fundamentally, the critical bioethical response to a pandemic is and will always be, and in every case, how do we save lives? How do we lessen the suffering endured by those who are ill? And then, of course, how do we contribute uh, in our own conduct to preventing further difficulties, further spread, observing those rules and guidelines that are so well known now. And how can we help others? Um, we think, of course, of the elderly who cannot get to the store, who need food, the sick person who can't walk their dog, sometimes very small things, but in almost every neighborhood and in every community, it's easy to find a way to serve safely, always with safety. Um, and that would be a, a fine response for every one of us. So I thank you for the time. Okay, thank you very much, Father Tom Davis. Um, That's very helpful. Now, our third speaker today is a, an old hand from iTest who's been with us for many years. Uh, Dr. Don Sparling is uh, a longtime professor from Southern uh, Illinois University in environmental sciences. He's also a deacon and very active in the uh, collegiality of deacons in his local diocese of Bellevue, uh, Illinois. And uh, his background is so familiar to us in ITES that I don't think I need to go into a whole lot of things about his uh, experience and so forth. So I'm going to go right in to let Don take over and give his talk on this presentation. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to assign to look at things a little bit more from the scientific perspective than from the ethics uh, or from a theological perspective. And uh, much of what I'm saying is probably going to be already known by everybody, but it's sometimes good to put things together in a way that um, most of the, or a lot of information is presented in one spot and you can make some sense out of it. Are we okay, Tom? Can you hear me? Okay, 
I've got a, I'm, I'm saying my internet connection is unstable. Yeah. So oh, if I, something happens, just let me know. We can hear Don, you. We can hear you. It's just delayed. The, the, um, the sound is, or the picture is delayed, but you can go ahead. Okay. All right. So the, the uh, mouth and the, and the noise don't coincide then, huh? The speaking in the mouth, whatever. All right. Um, so what is the coronavirus specifically? Well, a coronavirus is actually uh, a name for a family of viruses. You may have heard the uh, term the new or the neo cor uh, cor um, coronavirus disease, uh, which we refer to as the uh, COVID-19. Um, we say that it's new or novel because we've had, not pandemics, but we've had breakouts of other um, coronaviruses that affect humans. Um, of course, the name for the coronavirus comes from those beautiful little spikes that come out of the, uh, the body of the virus. Everybody has seen those nice color red pictures. I can guarantee you that a virus is so small that uh, there, are, there is actually no color. So that's actually artificial coloring you see on there. But it looks like a crown. A crown. Um, and the term coronavirus, I think, is very appropriate because one of the patron saints for disease is St. Corona. And so we have the, the name from there, from her as well. Um, some of the viruses that belong to this family are the human coronavirus 229E. It's caused some problems. Much of these things cause uh, stomach upsets, um, some of them may affect the heart. Uh, perhaps the most serious of the coronaviruses has occurred a few years ago called SARS, the SARS virus, where um, many people were affected and died from that. So when we talk about the coronavirus, we talk about a family. When we talk about COVID-19, we're talking about a specific virus. Now, what is a virus? Viruses are proto-life. They are actually so simple that we don't even, scientists don't even consider them to be living organisms. Um, they are parasites. They move through the environment, through the air or through the water, uh, infecting other bacteria. Those little, nice little red projections that come out of the body of, of the virus, uh, COVID-19 virus, help to attach to the outside wall of a cell or a bacterium. Once they've made an attachment to the bacteri bacterium or to the cell, they inject their uh, reproductive chemicals. Mostly it's RNA, uh, RNA which is a simple strand uh, of nucleotides. Some of them have a double stride uh, DNA. So it's, some of it's a little bit more complicated than others. Um, main thing about viruses, well, one of the interesting things is that they do not metabolize. They cannot generate their own energy. So by penetrating the wall of a bacterium, they go ahead and utilize the energy of the bacterium or the human cell, and they start reproducing. They attach their DNA or RNA to the, that of the host cell, and they start multiplying. They multiply so much that eventually they burst the cell uh, by the presence of their own little re offspring from that particular initial infection. <clears throat> and that's one of the biggest problems that we have with the viruses is, is that the um, reproductive reproduction destroys the cells. They may also, in the process, interfere with several other bodily functions from that particular portion of the organism. Um, we have viruses that are very specific. They only attack a certain species and perhaps even a, only a certain organ within the species. We have viruses that are much more general. So far, it seems like COVID-19 is pretty specific to human beings. We do not understand how COVID-19 um, causes its negative effects within the, within the organism, the host organism. But we do know that uh, 
doesn't seem to be that it's transmitted by any type of insect. So it's probably more other animal. So it's probably primarily uh, transferred entirely by air. That may, that may change. We're uh, processing research right now, and we may find other things happening that perhaps the virus uh, does um, travel on animals. But right now, it doesn't seem to be. OK. Um, excuse me for a second. Some of these viruses, uh, including COVID-19, uh, affect the lungs, pulmonary systems, uh, the heart. Uh, they may have other effects within the organism uh, simply because they burst the cells, simply because they may cause to uh, release toxins, a um, variety of different things. Now, the next section, unfortunately, didn't come, the printing did not come clear, so I'm going to try to, to look at this. This is the statistics. Hopefully, I can make some sense out of my own writing. Um, as of Monday afternoon, at least 30,000 people have died, and the virus has been detected in at least 170 countries. Uh, as maps show, 4%, that's over just about a 4% mortality rate. Now, the viruses that we are most familiar with that cause flus most of the time throughout other years have about a one or maybe even, it depends upon the virus, a one or 0.1% uh, mortality. So we don't have any vaccines or any way, any a uh, very effective way of treating the COVID-19 virus. So we're seeing a little bit of higher mortality rate. One of the things that in determining mortality rates is we don't include those, that, those people that have been affected but aren't really showing symptoms and then never report themselves to a hospital or to another group. So the actual Mortality rate of around 4% is actually a lot lower than that because we simply don't have a, a good handle on the number of people that have been affected but not have shown signs. Um, mainland China, as reported by uh, Tom, seems to be leveling out. There are reported incidents of uh, new cases uh, over the past several days has been very, very flat. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the reliability of data coming from China. I don't know if the source is the Chinese government itself or uh, if it's uh, some more <clears throat> object objective organization, but it seems like it's leveling out, which is wonderful. In Italy, uh, 101,739 people, uh, that might be different, it's, got a, it's not real clear, um, have we encountered the virus. They've had the highest mortality rate so far. Uh, 11,591 people have died. That's 11.4% mortality rate. Now, you might ask yourself, why is it? Why has Italy had such a high mortality rate? Well, according to the news reports, when they were first, when um, COVID-19 came into the country, there were a lot of young people, young adults, that totally ignored the threat of the virus. And they continue to go out on beach during spring break and so forth. They came down with the COVID virus uh, much more quickly uh, than other countries. Italy simply wasn't prepared for the onslaught of victims of this disease. Um, in comparison to other deadly viruses, Ebola uh, in Africa, about 90%, up to a 90% mortality rate. So when you're talking about a four or average 4% mortality rate, uh, the COVID-19 is not by far the most, most dangerous virus that we've had. Rabies vaccine, vaccine excuse me, rabies vaccines, if you are um, bitten by a rabbit animal and you don't get medical care, your mortality rate for rabies is 100%. Uh, you will not survive uh, without getting care. So again, we have to put things in perspective. We, although we are very concerned about COVID-19 rightly, it is not, has not been the major virus that we have seen uh, in the past. Um, 
other pandemics, okay, uh, the HIV AIDS, um, uh, several million people have died from HIV AIDS. The flu pand pandemic in 1968, a million people died. Uh, there was another flu epidemic in 1958, where two million people have died. And then finally, a flu ep uh, pandemic in 1918, uh, death toll around 20 to 50 million. The worst we've ever had. Um, and it's very, uh, we would actually put this almost in the time of antiquity as the Black Death. Uh, it was transmitted by fleas that were on the right, uh, backs of rats, but it was a virus, and a death toll was 75 to 200 million people. About two-thirds of Europe died because of the Black, the black Death. So where do we sit now with, with guards today? Well, COVID-19 is something that we need to be concerned about. We don't understand fully what the transmission is. We don't fully understand yet. Uh, what is the average mortality rate? 4% is probably high. It's probably a lot lower than that if we could calculate the number of people that have been uh, infected by it, but have made it but never reported it. So is it something to be concerned about? For sure. I, we have never behaved, the world has never pay, behaved to a possible pandemic like they have with COVID-19. So it's kind of interesting to see how everything is going to be played out once the disease is um, under control. Um, thank you. That's about, that's about all I really have to say. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, Dr. Dan Sparling from uh, Southern Illinois. We are now in a position to be able to take questions and hold a discussion among uh, all of our speakers with each other, as well as with uh, questions submitted by our audience. And so we have Sheila Roth, our principal officer at our headquarters office of ITEC in St. Louis, who is going to be managing that question and answer. Okay. Th yes, thank you, Tom. And thank you to all of our presenters. Excellent job. Um, we don't have any questions posted on our group chat. So if anybody would like to post some on your sidebar of your screen, you can do that. I will initiate the first question. And I have a question for Father Tom. Father, you talked about... Um, when you have to decide, when, when the doctors decide who gets the care, that individual assessment is needed. And there were several ways of assessing that. And you said it was being done by a team of experts. And my question is, are there moral leaders involved in that team of experts or is, princip is it just the medical team? Well, uh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, there's, there are, there are different teams at different places along the decision-making line, right? So at the moment decisions are made with the patient in the hospital room, for instance, or the emergency room, it is a medical team. But they're following criteria and guidelines that are put in place by uh, other teams. I mean, sometimes they are also part of that team that's possible at emergency room personnel experts in that kind of field are also part of the teams that put together the guidelines. For example, in Texas, the guidelines put together by the Texas Medical Society um, brought in a, a wide range of different disciplines and experts. Primarily, uh, they're looking at experts in emergency care, and they're looking at experts in pulmonary care. Those are the two major disciplines, but other medical experts are involved in that. And they set forth uh, a criteria you can go online and find lots of these um, available in different sources. Uh, for instance, one from the University of Pittsburgh that I just downloaded the other day is allocation of scarce critical care resources during a public health emergency. And this is designed to deal not just with an infectious disease pandemic, but it could be a natural disaster, earthquakes, tornadoes. It could be during a time of war. 
when uh, we see how this actually happened recently in cities in Syria. Uh, in my particular uh, church, the Melkite Catholic Church, most of the people uh, who are members of that uh, particular church are either Lebanese or Syrian or Jordanian, Israeli, Egyptian from the Middle East, many in Syria, and they were isolated and often without access to adequate medical resources. So rationing decisions get made and have to be made in the face of those circumstances. Fortunately for us in the United States and for other countries that have uh, well-established medical systems, and there are many, uh, there are uh, criteria for determining who's going to be getting care. And as I mentioned, the critical bioethical concern in that is that people are not excluded because of a single factor like age or disability, but get an individualized assessment based on the actual presentation of the specific circumstances, the, you know, the here and now analysis. And that's what the allocation of scarce resource critical care guidelines in Texas, in Pennsylvania, and other states that are getting these out provide for. So that, and as I mentioned as well, so you, so you have a, a team of medical personnel who make the actual decision with the patient. You have other groups that help establish these criteria that those teams apply. You have others in addition to that, such as the Department of Justice that has a division that oversees how those criteria are being applied to make sure they're being applied uh, in a just manner and evenly. Will there be mistakes made in those decisions? Of course there will be. Medical mistakes happen with frequency. Uh, exactly what that frequency is, we'll never really know. But uh, if you've met the medical people, if you've spent time with them, while well, Nicodor I mentioned working with them at Wild Cornell Medical Center, an unbelievably fantastic facility, uh, you learn very quickly that regardless of where they come from or whether they're religious or agnostic or atheist, they deeply care about helping people. And they're trying very hard to do that. Uh, these criteria, so your answer to your question is the criteria are established by more than uh, just one person. They're applied by a different group, that is medical personnel. And uh, there is uh, a certain amount of government regulatory oversight over that by public health departments and by the Department of Justice. Great, thank you. It sounds like it's um, a good system set up. I, I really do think we have an excellent yeah. system. Um, so people can get very worried. There can be a great deal of concern. What happens if I, if I go, are they going to not give me a ventilator? Um, well, your, your, your condition, your acute symptoms, your underlying morbidities, all that's going to be assessed. And they're going to be assessed the same way everybody else is assessed. That's the ideal. Right. Where, will there be mistakes? Well, mistakes are part of decision-making but the criteria are in place, the good faith is in place. I have a high level of confidence about that. Great, great, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Jennifer Arrow. She says, I came in during the middle of Father Tom Davis's discussion, so I apologize if this was covered. However, I've been reading articles where some medical professionals and analysts are questioning the data that is out on this. For instance, many feel that we're much further along with this virus in our country than we may think. To me, the only way to gather more data is for all of us to be able to test ourselves to see if we've already had the virus and not realized it. Is there going to be an effort to do this? And I, I, I think that might be um, to you, Father Tom. I think actually I thought Nicanor raised his hand there. He'd like to. Oh, it. good. Did he? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, go I'd ahead. Like to respond to this as a molecular biologist. A lot of people believe that the test that is being done is something that can be done akin to a pregnancy test. Mm -hmm. So this is not the case because what we're looking for here is we're looking for the RNA molecule that is present in the coronavirus. And you actually need incredibly expensive RT-PCR machines and very sophisticated technology in order to do this. We are developing antibody tests 
And the idea here is that the antibody test is going to detect antibodies in your blood. The tricky part is that it takes the human body up to five days a week to develop those antibodies. So you could actually have the coronavirus in you, but if you've not mounted an immune response yet, then the antibody test will test negative, which is why here in the Philippines, the antibody test is used to, to determine if you're positive, and if you're positive, you're brought directly into the hospital, but if you're negative, that negative test has to be confirmed with this much more basic RNA test. This is not something we will, you will ever be able to do in your house. So, um, you know, so the reality is, is that the kind of testing that we're talking about here is we want to make sure that the test is available, the test is quick, that you can go in and get it done. But it's not going to be something that you can do at home. You, the idea, of course, in South Korea is you just drive into a drive through they basically swab you, and then you get your test results in a couple of days on the computer. I think that's kind of like the ideal right now, is that you have to go somewhere, get yourself swabbed, and the test will be returned to you in a day or so. Okay. All, All right. right, thank you, uh, yes. Sheila, can I add a uh, quick footnote? Of course. Um, there is the word triage, which means three, the three splittings. People are put in three different categories, but that doesn't mean there's one third in each. Probably most people will get slight symptoms and all the people who are sitting home with the coronavirus running a mild fever, like 99 or 99 and a half, less than 100, and don't bother to go, they are in fact conducting triage. And they're in the group in which no particular effort is needed. So when we talk triage, we're talking about that small fraction at the one extreme where you must partition people into those who can be helped and those who don't even come in in the first place because they're not in bad shape. And then finally, a small category of people who in fact die from pneumonia. Right. So when we use the word triage, we have to recognize that it's the three different categories, but not three different fractions of the people. Right. Uh, Father Tom, you wanted to add something? I, I did, uh, and this goes back to uh, something that Deacon Don was speaking about, and it just because I came across it uh, when I was in the car, I heard it on the radio today, um, and then I pulled up some preliminary work on it to read, but I only have uh, very, I only have an abstract, so I don't have much information. But the Lancet Journal of Infectious Disease came out in the last 24 hours with an article that's estimating that the mortality rate, and Lancet Infectious Disease is a respected peer-reviewed quality publication. Um, and they're estimating a much lower mortality rate than we've been hearing, which is an encouraging piece of information and it might give people some grade to come. Uh, they're estimating a mortality rate of 0.66%, uh, um, considerably lower than the rates we've been hearing uh, in other estimates. And what they did was they ran that based on various assumptions about uh, undetected uh, infection rates. So exact details of that study I don't have available to me. But um, as we've all been saying in this webinar, there's a lot we don't know about, uh, about these uh, rates and how lethal the disease is. But uh, it is uh, to see a journal like uh, Lancet Infectious Disease come out with that kind of uh, study is an encouraging sign. Um, and again, it really does highlight the importance of Father Nicanor's earlier observation that therapeutic treatments really are a focus because we're not going to see that vaccine for a long time. I mean, we're 12 to 18 months down the road for vaccines. So, if the mortality rate is a bit lower, if uh, more resources are put into the approach for therapeutic treatment, um, we can have some strong hopes about a better uh, situation when we face the possible next wave in the fall. Okay, uh, Deacon Don, did you have something to add? Yes, I just wanted to go ahead and support uh, Father Tom's comments. You know, um, the as I mentioned in my, my talk, the viruses that we've had around for a long time 
causing flu and we get shots for and unfortunately in many cases we miss the, uh, the particular strain and that's going around. But for those that are the common virus uh, strains, we have an overall mortality rate of, based on years and years of data of 0.1%. So when we get down to 0.6%, I think we're getting close to, to reality. I think that's probably a very good estimate. We will not know the actual percent mortality uh, until this is completely clear. We have an, a, a, some sort of estimate of, again, of those that were sick but didn't report it. But 0.6% means that, you know, uh, it gets down to reality, except in situations like Italy, where people just simply ignored uh, the virus and then uh, many died because of that. Okay. Yes. Can I just add gonna... something to that? Yes. Um, with comparing the point one to the point six, uh, just a couple of things that I'd like to highlight. First of all, we have to keep in mind that the percentage is not as important in a pandemic as the absolute number in a short period of time. Because if you had something like 10,000 deaths spread out over the course of a year, it's very different from 10,000 deaths in a week. Because the, because, and I think one of the things that you see in Italy is not simply the fact that they were not prepared, but what you actually see is that in Northern Lombardy, in Lombardy and Northern Italy, you have a, the total collapse of the healthcare system. So individuals who probably would have been saved had they received a ventilator uh, didn't receive one. And so the, the, the reason why it's a 10% death rate in Italy is probably because not only because uh, Italy has a higher number of percentage of elderly, only second to Japan. We, and we, we know that the, the lethality rate in individuals over 80 rocket, it skyrockets to 20, 25%. But I think what happens is you had both an elderly population that was unprepared and uh, a healthcare system that collapsed under the burden of the, cr the crush of numbers. I mean, in the last week I've been working on the question of ventilation and allocation of ventilation. And what you see in Italy is that doctors had to choose between two people. They had to choose and, and they had to choose and they knew that the person they didn't choose would die. And so we're trying to avert that situation. It is clear that, this, that New York City is approaching that critical point. There are graphs that suggest that peak resource use in New York is going to be realized in about 10 days. So 10 days from now, we're going to have maximum need for resources. And I was just looking up a number where something like 20,000 beds short in New York City for the numbers of patients that are going to be flooding those hospitals. And so, you know, one of the things we mustn't forget is that the numbers, the numbers are something we're going to be able to figure out a year from now, two years from now. But the problem now, the reason why we have to, to practice social distancing, the reason why we have to, to shut down everything is because we, we cannot have all those numbers show up in the ER tomorrow. And, that, that, and, and I think, I know that my students sometimes fail to appreciate that because they see the, that the percentage and they say, well, COVID is only six times more lethal than flu, which is what it would be if the Lancet number of 0.6 is correct, is accurate. The tragedy, of course, is that that number is 0.6 of millions and millions in a week. And so what ends up happening is you overwhelm everybody. And not only do you have COVID patients dying, you have patients who have heart attacks, who have strokes, they're dying because the ER is simply too full and there are not enough ventilators to put them on those ventilators. And I have former students who are now ER docs and they're all telling me that's their worry. Their worry is actually not the COVID patient or the number of COVID patients. It's the overwhelming burden of the sheer number that they're expecting. It's a tsunami of patients that is expected to hit the East Coast in the next two weeks. 
Okay, thank you. Hence the uh, flattening of the curve, which we all keep hearing about. So there's the reasoning, right? Uh, I have a question here from Dr. Karen Astromelli. Uh, sorry if you address this. Dr. Fauci mentioned that there are phase one trials for some possible medications being tested before phase two and three are completed. Should Dr. Fauci and the FDA give whatever drug is preventing death should be given to all that are sick, especially those doctors, nurses, and first responders that are now testing positive? Is this really, this is really an ethical question. And what does Father Davis think of this scenario? The rationale for the question is the antivirals or antimalarials may prevent mortality and the need of thousands of ventilators. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I, that's a question I've been working on as well. Good. Um, for, first of all, even today, bioethics, there is a category of drug use called compassionate use. And in compassionate use, the FDA and sound bioethical reflection basically affirms that a physician can try drugs that, are, that have not been completely tested on patients who are dying, simply because the patients who are dying are such that we're gonna try whatever we can. And so even now, the FDA for the anti-malarial drugs, hydrochloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, just two days ago, the FDA granted emergency an emergency authorization for use of these drugs, even though the clinical trials have not yet been completed. Number one. Number two, these drugs are being tested in a worldwide test governed by the World Health Organization. And physicians here in the Philippines and throughout the world are basically being invited to simply try out whatever drug is indicated on the World Health Organization site. And they're only testing for one thing, shortening of time spent in the hospital. They can't afford or they can't test for viral, viral road. They can't test for any of the other quantifications that biologists usually do. They simply want to ask, if I give you this drug, will it, shorten, will it shorten your stay in the hospital? And the hope is that these, as the trial is ongoing, there are ethicists and epidemiologists who are looking at the data. And as soon as they see any significant results from this global trial, what they will then do is authorize the use of this drug for other populations of individuals who are not availing themselves of this drug. Again, under the bioethical principle that if there is reasonable chance that the benefit will outweigh the risk, then you should be able to approve it for patients who are sick especially those who are dying. Okay, great. Um, anybody else have a response to that one? Okay, another question from Patrick Pinozo. How do we best gauge the restriction of the sacraments at such a critical time? If grocery stores are quote, essential businesses, what are we saying about the closing of our churches? Well, I think a few of us might want to talk about that, if I might just say a few words on it. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier that in the Byzantine churches, Lent is a-liturgical, so that we don't have a Eucharistic celebration outside of Sunday at any time during Lent. Well, there's one exception, that's the Feast of the Annunciation, it was just last week. Um, I think... Uh, it's Father Luke's a video that one of the promotional materials for this webinar is very helpful. And it's something that's common to the Byzantine experience. Uh, to experience this uh, as a period of fasting, to engage and embrace the absence of, of being able to attend Holy Mass and to receive communion as a fast. And fasting is not about um, trying to make ourselves miserable. Right, fasting. And in a circumstance where we treat something like this as fasting, um, fasting is designed and is meant to be an opportunity to uh, strengthen 
our spiritual life. So it's really an opportunity to go deeper and more profoundly into spiritual life. Uh, of course, no one wants to be denied uh, the opportunity of the sacraments. Uh, and I don't think it's fair uh, for people to, I hear a lot of criticism of bishops who are closing churches. Um, what are they supposed to do? We have a parish in my town that is 3,200 families. If they open the church to mass, you're going to have people packed in like sardines and you're going to massively increase the infection rates. So I, I, I don't think that uh, it would be good stewardship and I think it would be a serious question of whether or not there's an adequate observation of the fifth commandment if you didn't close the churches and instruct people to stay home and pray. So um, embrace the opportunity to experience it as fasting, deep in the spiritual life, deep in prayer, deep in repentance, uh, and observe uh, it as an opportunity to contribute to prevention of further spread of the illness. I think that should be an adequate emotional response and practical response for everybody who's thinking clearly about it. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Sebastian Moffat. How safe are hospitals that are filled with infected people? <laughs> Anyone want to answer that? Well, let me, I'll just do oh, a quick, very quick. Uh, okay. No one really knows the answer to that question. Um, but obviously, uh, when you go to a hospital, the one thing everyone knows is you want to get out as soon as you can. Because hospitals have germs. Hospitals have illnesses around. Uh, so, sure, uh, the situation is... Uh, going to be worse. But here's one thing that's happening. Public health authorities in cooperation with the hospital authorities are identifying certain facilities as COVID facilities. They're moving the patients out who are not uh, in absolute critical condition and can't be moved. They're moving patients out who can go to other facilities and they designate a particular hospital in a region to take COVID patients and put the other patients in a different facility and isolate that facility. So that's one approach that is an imperfect one uh, because you don't always know who has it, who doesn't, uh, but it's one of those steps on the way. So sure, there are uh, additional risks going into facilities that have lots of COVID patients. Just like if you happen to go in uh, to a supermarket where there are lots of people who have COVID, you don't know if they do or not. Um, but if you need to be in a hospital, don't not go because of that concern. If you have a critical condition that requires hospitalization, get yourself to a hospital. Uh, make the call, let them know you're coming. Um, so that's a, I realize that's the best thing we can say about that. There's increased risks. That's the nature of a pandemic. Uh. Okay. Very good. Um, Sheila, I think that we are probably at a time when we should wrap up this particular webinar. Uh, it would be a good idea to, uh, I think, close with a final closing prayer. And I'd like to ask Sister Marianne Postiglione of ITEST to give us that prayer. Okay, here I am. I've taken this little reflection from a portion of the Lord of the Rings where Elrond the king is advising the hobbits as they prepare to take on the task of finding the ring in order to destroy it. We pray these words as our own as we apply them to the plague of the coronavirus. At least for a while, said Elrond, the road must be trod, but it will be very hard and neither strength nor wisdom will carry you far upon it. This quest may be attempted by the weak with as much hope as the strong, yet such is oft the course of deeds that move the wheels of the world. Small hands do them because they must, while the eyes of the great are elsewhere. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you promised us that you would be with us to the end of the world. In this time of pandemic, take these small hands of ours 
those of the healthcare workers, nurses, physicians, all those serving the sick, the elderly, and the needy, and make those small hands instruments of your grace and healing. In the name of our suffering Lord and Redeemer, amen. Thank you very much, Sister Marianne. Um, with that, we're going to draw this uh, webinar to a close. Again, I remind you that the name of it is COVID-19 and Man's Continued Desire for God. This will be posted very promptly on the iTest website so that you may come back and see it again as you wish, or you can tell others about it, that it's there and it's ready to be accessed on the iTest website. So we thank all of you for participating today and we pray for you and your continued good health. Goodbye.